All right, welcome to another episode of Gaudier or Nay. I'm here with Craig Carswell. Craig, thanks for joining me, brother. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, this is going to be fun. Uh, yeah, Craig, so, like, I guess you're a musician. Um, I love your songs, dude. Like, so many, like, so such heart and soul in your songs. That's, like, just refreshing to see. I love that kind of music. Uh, what, what kind of genre would you say you're in? Uh, uh, like, I guess for my solo stuff, I would just say that I'm a singer-songwriter. Okay. Kind of, I don't know. A lot of people call me a country artist, but I'm not a country artist. Like, I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't identify myself as a country artist so uh but a lot of the people think I am so but I would call myself a singer songwriter and then I'm in a, a rock band as well as a metal band so okay you know. <laughs> yeah because I was uh listed and uh I guess people probably think that just because it's like when you're singer songwriter you're just with your guitar right yeah, 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 yeah. So they're probably like, oh, well, that's obviously country. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, that's hilarious. Uh, dude, Um, we're both from the same town. And uh, just to see like uh, like your success over the last few years, you're rising up, um, you're getting notoriety. Um, I love just chatting with artists from the same home I'm from. So it's like it's really cool to like see what where you're going. Uh, maybe give my audience a little bit of a background, just like a little bit of your story, just so we, they can kind of know who you are, man. Sure. So, well, I was born in High River, <laughs> uh, <laughs> raised here. I still I live just outside of High River now uh, on an acreage with my wife, and I have a son. Uh, he just turned two in May. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I'm a musician, and I own a recording studio in High River called Red Black Recording. Uh, so I'm a record producer as well. And I have a record label called Red Black Recording, but it's Red Red Black Records. Um, as far as my story goes, I guess, like, to sum up, I I played, I, I'll, I'll do like after high school. So after high school, I played in metal bands for like 10, 11 years, I would say. And uh, throughout all that time, I was like slowly developing a bit of a drug and alcohol problem. Mm. So... Uh, my wife decided to go to school up in Olds and uh, I just needed a change of scenery for a while. So we decided to move up there. Um, I spent about, we lived up there for two years and I didn't do anything musical at all. I was just kind of trying to like get over my personal problems and stuff like that. And then we moved back. I still didn't do anything for musical for like three years. And then my wife was kind of getting sick of me moping around and being sad all the time. So. <laughs> She started researching uh, schools where I could go learn to do audio production because I was kind of over wrecking my voice, screaming in metal bands and stuff like that. So I kind of wanted to get more into the behind the scenes aspects of the music industry so that I could still be involved. So she found this uh, a couple of studios in Calgary, but I ended up going to this place called The Beach um, and did their it was uh, the Alberta School of Production and Recording Arts. And I did their sound engineering course there. And then uh, I produced bands and, and one guy from Calgary named Hayden McHugh. Um, he's like an LGBTQ uh, singer songwriter. Like most of his songs are like, are geared towards that community. So we, I did that for a while, which was like a huge step in the opposite direction for me. Cause I was doing metal for so long before. And then all of a sudden I was in this like gay synth, synth pop band, which was like super cool for me. Cause it was like, <laughs> it, pushed, it just pushed me way out of my comfort zone. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so I played with him and then I still hadn't really been like writing music or anything like that. Um, we went to New York for vacation one time and uh, just everything in New York. Like, I'm not sure if you've been to New York, but like everything there blew me away and opened my eyes and like made me, I guess, re-inspired me towards writing. Mm. So I wrote a song called New York Lights and I, I was just convinced that everybody was going to hate it. And that it's a great song, man. Thanks, man. But yeah, I made a music video for it just because my friend Maxwell, we were filming a, a music video for another friend of ours at the time. So while we were at the location, I was like, hey, can we like spend an hour and just do a video for me for this song? And he was like, yeah, cool. So we did that. And then I released it and like, yeah, like everybody from High River really supported me on that and like helped me push it out. And I guess the rest since there is is basically like just what I've been doing up till now. So um, I started focusing more on being a, a solo musician. And then since then, I've joined a couple bands and and really tried to expand my 
my horizons that way musically but that's pretty much like the Coles Notes version of my history <laughs> hey man that's a very cool history and I like how you had to like go get re-inspired um I think that's like a lot of like for any artist like you went through that whole like 10 years of being in a band um you, you know you learn a ton of fundamentals doing that kind of uh, work and everything and like I know from comedy my thing is kind of similar and like you know you can develop like <laughs> addictions like you said because like it, it can happen like that especially when you're doing road and stuff but it, it seems like you kind of then lost your way and then you had to kind of refine it a little bit right yeah, definitely. I definitely lost my, I, that's like a great way to put it. I definitely lost my way or I guess I just lost track of, of who I was, I guess. And, uh, sort of got lost in the lifestyle that I was living in. And, uh, am I allowed to swear? Yeah. Yeah, man. Swear just, as much as you want. Just getting fucked up. Right. Like it, it became like, it became the priority for me. Mm. And that's like, I don't know. It's, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to walk away from, but once you kind of like, once things are put into perspective for you, it's easy. Like, and that's what I found is like, once I kind of regained my perspective on what I wanted from my life and realized, like, I think a, a lot of people's issues um, with like not being able to overcome stuff that, that happens to them in their lives is not realizing that yeah, maybe somebody else or, you know, a different circumstance created the issue that you're in, but it's up to you to get yourself out of it at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that was like, that was the big turning point for me is when I realized like, nobody's handing me anything. I have to, if I want something, I have to go out and get it and work really hard to try and get it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, as you know, too, like, cause you were talking about like me coming up with success, but like, you're in the exact same boat as me. Right. Like, you're a hometown boy, like everybody's super proud of you, like stoked to see you like doing such cool stuff. You know what I mean? Like it's, uh, but I'm sure like you probably realized at some point, like nobody's going to hand this stuff to you. And I, I guess like you've been doing this for a long time, right? Um, you probably hey. realized that long before I did, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I kind of, I kind of had like this, I guess a sense of entitlement, but I, I've lost it severely since then. <laughs> hey, and fuck, man, you said a ton of stuff that resonates with me so much. And uh, yeah, that sense of entitlement's true. And I think as an amateur in any kind of art form, you develop that sense of uh, entitlement a little bit. You start creating stuff and you start getting a little bit of, I, I wouldn't call it success, but a little bit of like just positive movement and whatever you're creating. And all of a sudden you, your ego starts getting inflated. And then you're like, why aren't I getting these opportunities? I had the same shit, man. And like, honestly, the, the, when you said it became more about the party or more about getting fucked up than actually doing the music, I've been there too. Like I've been going to shows because like, especially when I was just in Alberta, like I would be like touring around and it would just be like a lot of times you're going to a show and it's, it's more about the party afterwards than actually doing the show. Right. And you stop taking the art forms um, seriously anymore. And that really, it really can tear you apart. Cause I had to do the exact same reset you did. And a lot of it was kind of moving to Toronto. Like you moved to Olds leaving yeah. where I was getting into a newer environment finding that perspective again and then rediscovering the love for the art like exactly. I think that's what like it seems like that's the process you kind of went through and like it's so similar to mine man yeah you betcha yeah that was that was definitely it was good that I went through it though I'm I'm happy I did honestly at the end of the day like it, it sucked while it was happening but it's it's taken me to a point in my life where I'm like, I'm, on, I'm basically like no turning back now. Right. Like there's no way I would go back to doing that. Plus I've gained, I'm older now and I, I have, you know, a kid now. So I've got a few, like a lot of my perspective on everything has changed. Like the way that I view my entire world has completely changed since that. Right. So. No, I can understand that when you were in your partying days, though. So was it like, uh, was it kind of like a train wreck kind of thing? Was it like partying like a ton or like how, how, how was that? And like, how was coming out of it? Like, well, I was like, I think I was misdiagnosed with ADD. Okay. When I was really young. So I was on Ritalin for a long time. And then 
when I was an adult, I was having trouble concentrating in college and I went and talked to a doctor and he said that he thought I had adult ADD. And then I was like, okay, so they put me on these other pills for it. So that was kind of what started it was just being on amphetamines all the time and, and, mm. and then drinking and, and it was a, it was a train wreck actually. Like my friends started calling me crash instead of Craig. Cause like, I'd just be so messed up all the time. Oh, damn. I, I embraced that. Like I was like, yep, that's me now. Like I'm this party guy, but um, honestly people don't like you as much when you're a party and dickhead. <laughs> oh really when did you figure that one <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it was uh that was a hard realization for me to come to but i think i've uh smoothed over most of the <laughs> the shit that i created back in the day no so, and uh yeah. just like knowing your personality now like i could definitely 100 percent see that like you smoothed it over uh but i never knew you during your party days or I, well i knew you but i guess i we never really connected too much during that so i can't really say much but i, I know what you're talking about when you say like you identified with the whole idea of being that party guy so like yeah. you were like hey like you call me crash all right i'm crash and like you know you you identify being that person. And I, I remember sometimes like, it's just weird how you can identify with the addictions you had. Like when I used to smoke, when I used to drink a ton, like I used to kind of identify myself with those two. And then the one thing that's a problem with that and how you have to kind of battle that if you want to get out of that cycle as you have, like what it's just, when you have that idea, it's like, it's hard to see yourself not drinking. It's hard to see yourself not being a party or a train wreck or whatever the hell it is. Like you, you all of a sudden like put that as part of your personal identity. And that can be really like, that's where I, I don't know, for myself personally, I had to like break through that identity, like just kind of stop being like, no, like, I don't need to be that person. I can go and do shows and just be completely sober and be completely fine. Like, did you find a way, like, how was it for you to like kind of break through that identity? Um, well, I, I honestly have never played a show since I started doing this solo acoustic stuff. I've never been under the influence of anything playing a show. So nice. Um, I prefer, I prefer to be sober. It's just like a day job for me. Right. Like I, I want to show up and do a really good job. And I find that I become a little bit lackadaisical about my performance or maybe, you know, engaging with the crowd when I'm on something. So I, I, I honestly prefer, I prefer performing and, and being around people in general, you know, completely sober. Um, it also kind of lets you take in a little bit of like, I guess watching people is kind of another good deterrent because you're like, Oh yeah. Yeah, I don't want to be that guy again. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess at a music venue, you probably see that every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see it a lot. But it's, ha, 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 ha. I don't know, when you're, you feel bad too, because you like, you can see people like, some people go out and have a good time, they can have a couple of drinks, you know, and they're fun. But then you see other people who are like, you can tell it's just like, you know, this person's obviously in some kind of pain or distress and they're they're just like approaching it the wrong way but it's hard to like talk to people sometimes when they're in that state it, when, and if they're under the influence 100 percent. Right. because everybody's like oh you say the you say the most truth truthful stuff when you're drunk no you just spout a load of bullshit and that's all that it is like like uh there's a reason why you don't say shit sober that you would say drunk to certain yeah. people you don't act that way right yeah, yeah. I'm glad to be away from it. I'm glad to be past that point in my life. And I don't even really like, I don't think of myself as an, like an alcoholic or a recovering drug addict or anything like that. Like, I don't consider myself to be in recovery or anything like that because I think I'm over it. But it's, I know a lot of people say that's a dangerous thing, especially like with AA and stuff like that. But it's, I do honestly feel over it. Like, I don't care. I couldn't care less if I, you know, was going to go get messed up. I'd rather come write a song than you know, drink a beer or whatever. Hell yeah. Hey man, nothing but respect to that. I love that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about you kind of re rediscovering your passion for music, especially because you said this was like, what was it? A five-year period where you weren't writing anything? Yeah. So I, I wrote constantly when I was in my last metal band Grimm's End, like I was constantly writing lyrics and I've been writing lyrics and poetry and journaling and stuff 
pretty much as long as I can remember, like since I was a kid, I've always kind of written, I guess, written out my feelings, like in, I guess, songs or poems or whatever. Um, but it was, yeah, it's like, I'm just trying to think of like the best place to start for it. Like it was a, New York is definitely what, what kind of triggered me. And I, I, I told this story on my friend Carla's podcast, but it was like, it was just one moment I remember in New York um, where I was, I was standing on the street and we were, we were at the National Film Academy. Mm. And there was all these like swanky people coming in, like dressed up, you know, to the nines. Like they were, they were going somewhere. Right. And they, they were like, I forget what it was, but there was like David Schwimmer and a bunch of people walked by us, like all these like famous actors and stuff. Right. Okay. But then on the opposite side of the road, <clears throat> there was this homeless guy. Nobody was paying, not one person was paying attention to him. Like people were like almost hitting the guy walking past him, trying to see all these celebrities that were going into the national film center. And I noticed that he was like, he was pulling his pants down and he took a shit on this, like right on the fucking road. Ha, right. Ha, 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 ha. Well, but then he's like trying to pick it up and like, nobody notices the guy. Right. So I'm, what kind of like got my brain going I was, it was just like you know what brought him here and how did he end up in that situation and like why is nobody paying attention to that guy why is everybody paying attention to these guys like like that's where the line kind of um like the whole chorus is based on that exact moment in my life when I was witnessing this happen right because it's like you know there's a million dreamers and a million broken hearts you just have to decide which side you're on that was oh, kind of wow. where that, that was kind of where that line came from because like I'm sure like he didn't move there as like this broken-hearted rundown person but you know sometimes a place can turn you into that but I think it's all about what you allow yourself to be turned into or I guess like a lot of people have a harder time with situations too um but that was mainly what got me writing again was that exact experience and moment was just like I just had this line going around in my head and and since then, I like I literally write like three songs a week, probably. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So that's, that's amazing. That's uh, that is such a cool. Like I know what you're saying. Like there's just like this contrast between like all the people walking into the film, uh, the National Film Institute or whatever it was, and then that like uh, homeless dude on the <laughs> corner taking a shit, which is an interesting, uh, interesting right. imagery. <laughs> it just like it was like it was really heartbreaking actually to watch yeah like, of course it's like why are we not as a society paying attention to that guy and we're worshiping all these like false gods basically is what i consider like huge celebrities right like they're a lot of them shouldn't be looked up to mm -hmm. you know what i mean and like mm -hmm. but it doesn't like that dude should not have been looked down on or overlooked in my opinion and that's kind of what I guess set me on the path of like where I'm going now. Like I always try to not overlook anybody. Like I always try to root for the underdog and you know, stuff like that. So that's, that's why I do like a lot of like youth supportive stuff because like growing up in high river, I found there was like, there was fuck all to do. Like you could drink or go to church or, you know, there was a skate park, but like what else was there really on the weekends for kids to do or like young adults, right? Like, there was no place for me to go play when I was 14. There was no place for me to like have that outlet. Right. So I'm trying to provide that now for, for the town, or at least try to be like, you know, some sort of like piece in the, in the movement that makes that happen. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that want to push youth music in high river. And I think that, I think it's a cool thing. Like a lot of, the, a lot of artists from high river are amazing. Like they, it's very an underrated town considering the amount of talent that we have here i think so that's that's fucking awesome man i didn't know that and uh yeah so you're trying to get like youth into like music and develop uh, that kind of stuff yeah for sure like my studio i offer massive discounts for youth and i still give them the same quality as like i would for an artist paying full price like a bigger artist so like the main thing i always tell them is like just like they come in and they're not expecting like the end product at the end of the day for what they paid for it but i'm mm -hmm. really trying to just help them and it's not really all about money for me i guess that's why i have a day job as well <laughs> ha, 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 ha. 
no man that's uh honestly that's like good work and like you're doing something to help the community i understand like uh i understand coming from high river how hard it is like growing up and when you don't have anything like luckily for myself like i was more of a sports guy so at least with sports you you are kind of occupied on the weekends and in the evenings and stuff so it's not like you know it's not too bad you're not just kind of wandering around figuring out your uh you know like that's where you can like like you said you just end up being a partier and you're just drinking your face off all the time which happened to tons of my friends growing up so it is kind of a waste of a youth right yeah i think so so like yeah i just want to have more positive more positive places for them to go like there's a youth center here but like i don't know if anybody really uses it um Mm. it's more like I'm more geared towards like the youth musicians, I guess, from town or artists, but it like, no, that's, and that's exactly it. You have some, some sort of like actual like sector or demographic that you can help out. You can't like, at the end of the day, no one can help out everybody. You have to kind of figure out where you're like more, most useful at. And yeah, that's both. exactly it. It's like, it, you, it's become so overwhelming, like trying to think like how to fix like all the giant problems that are happening in the world. You know what I mean? But it's, I always try to like narrow my focus down to like where I can help here and now Mm -hmm. and then hope that that kind of like, I hope that one person that I've hopefully positively influenced, positively influences somebody that can make a difference about something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it's all the little steps that help towards making the big difference. Hell yeah. And that the whole narrowing down, like you just said, it's, I think it's so important for like anybody when they're moving forward in life whenever when stuff is too vague when there's too many choices like that's where you get a paralysis or you're just like oh where do I go like if I go this direction maybe that direction was the proper way it's like you know it's like no just start moving and like the movement will bring the narrowing down like with it and like when you when you yeah when you narrow it down to something that's where you start finding yourself and finding like where you actually like bring value to the like exactly what you're saying right now with your music and helping people musically like that's where you actually start making big differences right yeah well hope hopefully i'm making a difference to some people <laughs> hey man the way everyone talks about you like i, I think you are um so I, this is cool so this new york experience turns into a song and uh it's a great song so i hope people check it out um but like, yeah, how, how, how about like, how do you think um, your experiences in life come like kind of like come through your music? Because like your music is very like, it has like a lot of soul to it. So it does seem like you're actually bringing in like real, like your real feelings or real, like what you've experienced in your life and bring it through your music. So do you, do you kind of see it like that? Yeah, definitely. I, everything that I write about is basically like, I don't write it a lot about specific situations I write about feelings and stuff like that and then I try to what I've tried to do for like my because I have three solo albums out so I have uh, December songs which came out in 28 or no 2019 Dark and Jury came out in 2020 and then yeah I just released uh, my new album Burning Bridges last year I guess so um Actually, no, it was this year I released it in January. So yeah, I've done an album a year. Um, That's amazing. Most of, my stuff, most of my stuff's based on mental health. Um, I try to give, like I, I have really, really bad anxiety. I have uh, chronic panic attacks in the mornings and stuff like that. Okay. Um, which, you know, I'm trying to like learn different ways to deal with and stuff like that. through Going to therapy, uh, exercise, something I've not done a whole lot of in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, that really seems to help <clears throat> um but yeah like i forgot where i was going with this well Sorry. you were talking about like mental health and uh yeah, oh, yeah. bringing it into your music and stuff so what i try to do is like because i as a songwriter i want to try to make my songs relatable to people mm-hmm. so i find that if i if I can twist the emotion that I'm having in the moment that I'm writing the song into kind of like a story about a relationship or something like that, people are more like, whereas I might not be talking about something that specifically happened to me. I, it's definitely like about something I've felt and it's just Mm. the way that the way I kind of imagined 
putting it out into the world. Like I, I always have a music video in my head for my songs, right? So whenever I write a song, I am like, this is how the video would go if there was a video. Oh, okay. So I kind of try to like, yeah, it's it's hard to dis- to describe, but like, I guess like the most, yeah, the most real songs I have are, are about specific situations, but a lot of my songs are just about like, me dealing with anxiety and I always find the best way to, for me to portray that is through like you know these fantasy relationship stories that I create in my head when I'm writing the song because mm-hmm. like there's no like anybody who's like had their heart broken or stuff like that they know how close that feels to like depression and like the anxiety that goes along with it so it's like it's easy to write a easier to write a heartbreak song than a you know I'm sad today song you know heck heck that, yeah yeah, I'd rather I'd rather try and make somebody else get something from it as well, although it is very personal to me. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I honestly like the way I started writing my comedy and the way I started changing it now is similar to what you're saying. When I feel a feeling inside of me, like now I'm trying to think, how can I make the audience kind of feel that feeling as well? And right. that's where when you get that connection that's where all of a sudden it's like a huge, like they, you get a huge response to it because all of a sudden they're feeling that feeling. And it's like you, it's a bigger connection than you just telling a joke or just telling a lyric. Right. Right. Exactly. No, I love that a lot. Um, so when you were doing the metal bands before, were you kind of talking about the same kind of uh, mental health anxiety? Was it like that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I'm like, I'm wondering if metal had that kind of, no I, not, I, yeah I don't know too much about metal so <laughs> it was just like super angry music there was a lot of like yeah I, I'm sure we'll get into this later but I don't I'm not like a I, I wasn't I've never believed in God I would say right okay but it was a lot of like kind of yeah it was just like anti-religion stuff anti blah 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 um, okay. You no, know, just your typical metal garble. Like it was just there's nothing. There's no real substance to a lot of it. Okay. There was a couple of songs that I wrote that I would say are similar to my writing style, or like I could see the progression towards what I'm doing now in them. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it was just like I'm gonna say the most badass thing <laughs> in the most, ha, 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 ha. and then that would just be like how I would write for that kind of stuff. I'm just like I just want to write evil sounding lyrics, even though yeah. I'm like the least evil dude alive i'm like a puppy dog but ha, 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 ha. yeah that's funny it actually sounds like uh like shock comedians for in comedy right. like they always try to write the most edgy shocking stuff where it just like everyone's like whoa yeah that must that must be hard to navigate nowadays for you guys eh uh it's uh it's definitely a little weird <laughs> right because like my my biggest thing with comedy was always like it's you know you go there kind of expecting that the guy's joking right (laughs) yeah yeah and uh yeah and like honestly you just like the whole the whole atmosphere around it it's a little weird sometimes honestly for myself though I'm not like I'm not really a shock comedian in any way so I don't know I'm just like uh I I like to like write my ideas like you uh, kind of like how you're doing like so For me, I know I don't usually run into issues like that too much, but uh, there's definitely a lot of comics who uh, that's kind of their bread and butter and they have to kind of figure that out now. <laughs> yeah, get, yeah, just the overly controversial stuff, I guess. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. So I I am interested in, though, like when you're kind of bringing mental health into your music, I, I do love that idea. And I, I do really like that, how you have these, like you said, you have these kind of like panic attacks and you have these like, feelings that can be like pretty rough but you found a way to kind of put it into your music with story and yeah. like allow other people to kind of have that feeling that's like that's powerful man I like I love that and that's like I think that's such a good thread creatively to keep pulling on because the deeper you get into that like I can and I can already see how much depth your music has now like you keep pulling on that thread I can just see how like uh, deep it can go and like how much connection you can make with people, man. I fucking love that. Yeah. I've, I've actually like, I've had people, it's weird, but I've, and <laughs> it's, it's so weird. Like I can't even get over how weird it is. Like when you get a message from somebody and they're like, Hey, like, you know, your song, you know, 
stop me from doing something bad last night. I just kept listening to it on repeat or like your song pulled me out of a dark place or like, you know, I, I get that a lot. And it's like, I thought that was like reserved for like super high up celebrities and stuff, but it it's weird as hell as like a normal person. Like I consider like, I, I don't understand what the big deal is like that people see about my music and stuff like that, but they, cause I consider it just like any other job, right? Like, I find architecture beautiful and that's why part of why I love New York. Right. And mm -hmm. you, you'd never see an architect. Well, maybe not most architects, but they'd rarely have an entourage of women and, and people like yes, men following them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even I find their art more beautiful than some of the, some of the false gods, like the, the celebrities that we worship and stuff like that. I find, I find some of their art like, to be garbage compared to like some buildings people have built like or if you ever go into like somebody's backyard and they've like made it really nice like that's their art form you know what I mean I always like I always try to respect every kind of art form as equal mm. but it's weird how as a society like we like push certain people up but I guess it's just like you said like it's the power of the message that they can relate to I guess that maybe they don't see in other types of art or you know stuff like that a hundred percent. And there's something with music, man. Music is just, uh, you know, it gets you into that flow state. Music is the only thing that can get you into a flow state as early as like, you know, when you first hearing it as a child, right? It, it's one of those things like comedy. I, I can even tell like, and like, I know there's a lot of comedians who make jokes, like comedians deep down inside wish we were musicians, like rock stars and stuff. But like, it is true, like comedy, like uh, you have to have people who kind of like are a little bit more enjoyful of the enjoying of the art form to like have that connection and get them into that flow state. But like for music, you can fucking toss it on in a car and you're driving and you just get the perfect thing. And then all of a sudden you're just like, bam, you're just vibing with it. And it can and like it can penetrate, you know, like for a building, like I know you say you respect architecture. It takes like a certain eye to really let that penetrate into your soul and really see a building and see like all the different features that are like so deep in it. Right. Like right. it takes a certain eye, like while in music that it, it just seems like something there's just so something so deep in music i think that's why uh music we always freaking take to the top right right yeah no you're right about that i i i honestly kind of feel the same way about comedy because i'm a huge stand-up comedy fan and like i just love like when when somebody can stand there and talk to me and they'll be talking like sometimes for an hour and a half and i felt like i've been sitting there for a half an hour you know, you're always like, you feel healed and, and released at the end because of all the laughing and stuff like that. Like, I'd almost like, I'd almost rather be a comedian, but I'm just not. <laughs> well, not good. All right, we'll switch jobs after this no, show. Fuck, I'm, I am not funny, man. I am not funny. <laughs> I kinda, so like, since I play such sad music, I kind of like, I'm like Mitch Hedberg without the really good delivery that he's got. So <laughs> like, I would, I'll start telling this joke, but it, it ends up going nowhere. Okay. And it's, it's always like, it's always a fizzler joke. So I, I had a guy come up to me after one show and he goes, he goes, man, I don't know if that was the best acoustics. Uh, what do you say? I don't know if that was the best acoustic singer songwriter show I've ever seen or the worst stand up comedy show I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All uh, right. I'm like, that's what I'm going for though. It's like the juxtaposition between like, me singing all this horribly sad stuff and then like trying to joke in between yeah and uh yeah i love that because it kind of shows that you're you're embracing all the kind of sad stuff or the like stuff that you go through in your life you're embracing it and you're fucking yeah you this that shows vulnerability man it's fucking awesome yeah i i, I like i've always like kind of been an advocate for um being vulnerable especially as a guy um, and especially as a guy with a, a little bit of a platform, like I, I think it's important that dudes are more vulnerable and, and talk more about the shit that's bugging them because like suicide's killing us, man. Like we're, our mental health is killing us. Our, the way that society has like told us we need to be our entire lives is killing us. And it's, it's not a good thing. So like, I'm an advocate for everybody's mental health, but especially like guys our age, like 
it's it's good to talk like you got to talk you got to get it out and um if i can inspire somebody to like talk to somebody about their problems by putting mine out on a public public platform like that's the only reason i would ever do something like that like it's never about attention for me like i would never i guess like any entertainer is a bit of an attention whore but i get that from like the musical side of it and like from playing live and stuff like that right but the rewarding part of it is like like i said like people messaging me or being like you know you i had one guy message me and he said like you know you inspired me to go talk to somebody about my issues he's like it's been so long but he's like seeing somebody like you and like people always think like to go talk to people about your issues you need to be at this like rock bottom state but it's yeah. like it's doing it before you get to that i think is the important thing you know what i mean mm -hmm. no man i understand that and like you said it is true like um yeah like i think everybody needs to be vulnerable and like like you said for especially men right now we're kind of taught to hold that shit in and not right. like not even talk about it and hey even like just for me starting this podcast, I remember at the beginning, it's like, I'm like, I can't be talking about these kind of things in front of people and like putting it out there. Like it was just even my, like, yeah. I'm like, this is like yeah. shit I'm so interested in. And I like was fucking so like, you know, I was just so fucking scared to actually talk about it in front of people, but breaking through that barrier now, it's like, now I'm excited to talk about these kind of subjects in front of people and it's true you want to do that so that other people can see it and be like okay that's okay to like it's okay to feel like that i felt those feelings like it's okay to be like that and it's okay to ask for help so fucking hell yeah man yeah i yeah that's that's what i'm all about really is just like i, I want to just like help people i don't really give a shit if i get famous or anything like that like i like i obviously like playing shows but my main goal is just I just want to help as close of a community as I can to me so mm -hmm. I honestly I think when you change your focus from like getting success and getting fame and all of those things to just being like I want to create and help people when you kind of limit it down and make it that simple it it's so relieving to the mind right. I, I was trying to think about that too because I've been like trying to think about my comedy as well in that sense because sometimes I do get too stuck into that success thing and when um when stuff comes popping around and I don't get opportunities and shit like eventually that kind of starts hitting me and my mental health as well because I start going like motherfucker like why didn't I get that you know all of that shit and you start like getting into that kind of mindset but you always have to kind of back off and narrow it down to like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? You're, you have to wake up every morning and do something like, what's your goal? Is it to get success and fame? Like, if that's your goal, then like get, get used to being like a lot of lot angry when shit doesn't come your way or go your way. But right. like when you kind of like now my whole reason is like, I, I try to like, all right, like what's the way to like narrow it down and make it just very easy to wake up in the morning it's like i i want to teach people and i want to bring joy to people like bang those are the two things I, i'm good at doing like right. i'm good at i'm good at doing this podcast and like giving ideas to people that they might not be as like uh, familiar with yeah and i'm good at bringing joy to people's life with my comedy it's like bang those are two things that are just fucking simple and it's fucking, I can wake up in the morning and it's easy. And like you said, then honestly, you just go and you keep pulling on that thread. You connect with more people and right. uh, yeah, and you don't, and it's like so much better on your mental health. Holy shit. It man. definitely is like, con yeah, I honestly, for myself, I don't think fame would be a good thing. I think I'd end up back into a place where I don't want to be. <laughs> yeah. You think with the party animal kind yeah, of thing? Yeah. I don't think I'd be able to, I, well, I guess it would depend on who I who was there with me but it would be like it's really just not I just woke up one day and I'm like this is not my end game this is not what I want like I just it's like you said like my my main goal if if I was like if somebody was to ask me like I always get asked this actually what's your plan like what's your marketing plan what's your because you know how much that's all involved with what we do mm -hmm. the I don't market myself like I'm a product and I know I should but I don't because I don't feel like I am a product like when I market, yeah, it's my goal. Whenever I'm asked that is like, people are like, well, what's your plan? Like, how are you going to, you know, achieve the next thing? I was like, I'm just going to keep doing things 
until something happens or I die. Like, <laughs> because what else am I doing? Like I'm, I'd be watching TV and I don't watch TV really that much anymore. Like I, I just, I just want to create stuff. And it's like you said, just like try and bring joy or solace or anything to anybody else if I can. Mm-hmm. I, if I do, that's a win for me at the end of the day. And, you know, like you said, I, I'll, I'll wake up easy the next day. Like, like your intentions are pure for what you're trying to do. So I can't really, I don't think you, like you can't ever fail that way. Right. If your goal is like this, this concrete thing, like fame, but it's like, how many famous people are happy? Like they're killing themselves too. It's, it's kind of like, yeah, honestly, it's kind of sad. And it's like, uh, the one thing I've noticed, even with that fame thing, I, 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 I'm in the comedy business. I know a ton of people who are killing it. And I, I see sometimes when they reach a level where I'm even like impressed where I'm like, damn, like you fucking are killing it. You kind of see it in them all of a sudden they're fucking all of a sudden they're looking at people even above them and then they, yeah, you know, and they're like, it's just, and they, oh, they're always in a constant, like anxious kind of shitty state. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean like, I'm a, like, I like, don't worry. Like I, I do want to be successful. Like one thing I do want to have in my life is to be able to like, um, put on shows where I want and be able to fill the place up. Like, but I don't need stupid fame or anything like that. Like I, I do like, my thing is if my intentions are pure, I do believe I'll, like I'll find some like a good success that will fit me and like allow me to raise a family and be like a family man and shit. Those are the things that are more important to me rather than fucking be some uber successful person. Right. Right. And I think, I think a lot of people like now their main thing is about getting fame is just the influence they can have over other people. But if what you're influencing other people with is bullshit, Mm -hmm know and that's what gets you famous like it's not gonna go any further than that I just don't see I don't see how fame is a is a great thing I'm I'm kind of with you too like I'd like to pay my bills with music and that's pretty much it you know be able to raise my my kid live a a comfortable life it's obviously nice filling venues um you know or, or being able to play where you want but right now I I think I am playing pretty much wherever I want right now like I'm not playing the saddle dome obviously but my band just got a gig at the back alley which like as a as a veteran of those times is pretty cool for me <laughs> hell yeah hell yeah all right fucking always good times at the back alley <laughs> <laughs> no i'm really excited though there that'll be, no, that'll be awesome buddy um so you're i don't know can we talk about your like anxiety attacks and like panic <laughs> attacks and stuff um I'm I'm just trying to wonder, like, how how do you any exercises that you've been doing that kind of help out with them? Uh, I do this thing called stack breathing. Okay. It's just like a breathing technique for when you're in that that state to try and pull yourself out of it. I also have found that, um, like, I get up and I pace a lot. Yeah, I, I I've had that too when I'm really anxious. Yeah. So when I wake up in the morning, I, I'll literally just, I have a big kitchen. So I'll just walk around my Island like 50 times until I start to calm down. Okay. And then, uh, some days it's so bad. Like I, um, there's not really a lot I can do about it and I have to take medication, which I'm working on getting off of, but it's not like, it's not like an everyday thing. Like most of the time I can, I can overcome it myself. Okay. And I also have a sheet that I, I, uh, fill out that, I call it my perspective sheet. So it just like, I write down the thought I'm having or what's causing my panic attack. And then I write down like the likeliness of the things that I'm, you know, building up happening on top of this, mm. of them actually happening. And by the time I'm done filling it out, I'm like, oh, so this is like not a big deal at all. Okay. <laughs> and then I'm just like, I kind of feel a bit better after that. But yeah, it's weird. It's like, since I quit um, taking that ADD medication that I was on, that's when it all started is like, I just started having these panic attacks in the morning and I'd never had anything like that, like anxiety or anything up until that point. Mm. Yeah, man. Fuck. Uh, and like, I know they can be rough and like, what's, what's the stack breathing? Like, is that like box breathing? Kind of like how, how does the stack breathing work? So it's just, um, it's basically deep breaths, uh, for different durations of time. Until okay. you're, so you go, you start with like, 10 seconds and then five seconds and then you know three seconds it's just about kind of slowing your breathing down 
yeah it's also an exercise i use for like vocal practice and stuff like that is like um just to like maintain your lung capacity and your breath and stuff like that yeah okay yeah. and i can see it for vocal practices that would be huge because yeah. when you're trying to get out of like a verse or something sometimes you need that whole breath and you can't you can't right. inhale until you know right to get it out exactly so it's a lot of it's breathing a lot of it is just like like going to therapy and stuff is the biggest help i mm. find just talking to other people you know conversations like this help everything helps i find like the more that i put it out there the easier it is for me to deal with and the more understanding people are too if they're perhaps dealing with me when i'm in one of those situations mm. which doesn't happen very often thankfully but sometimes it does and it's hard when you're a, a businessman and you are having a panic attack in the middle of a meeting or something and you can't just be like get up and leave you know what i mean yeah no that's, uh... ha that's happened to me a lot because like the, the nature of artists like some of us are just fucking weird and and hard to deal with and and sometimes toxic i would say like i think everybody's a little i hate the word toxic because i find that it's used as like a it's just like a label we put on people that don't agree with our beliefs you know what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. Something like that i hate calling people toxic but there's just no other way to describe certain people like they just come in and like their whole energy is funk and it's like <laughs> Like this guy's just gonna bring me down this whole time, like the whole time, because like you feed off of each other when you're doing artistic stuff like that, or anything in life, really. I find like you feed off other people's energy. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to deal with stuff like that when you have like a panic disorder or an anxiety disorder. Um, sometimes, but like I said, like since I've started putting it out there, people are a lot more understanding, and I'm in a band now with a bunch of guys who. Like Joel, the the other main songwriter in the band, he's really, really um, understanding because he kind of suffers through all the same stuff as mm -hmm. me. So that's actually been huge, like me and his uh, working relationship and our our you know friendship that we've developed um, has been pretty good. It's it's just you know talk to people. Fuck it. if you're dealing with shit, just you know yeah get help. That's what yeah you need. and what talk you to it? people. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of funny how you were saying like it's like about being vulnerable because your bandmate kind of has the same issues as yourself. Like if this was 20 years ago, you guys might not even be talking about it and be suffering like beside each other and not right. even knowing the other person has the same issues. Exactly. Yeah. If it even now, man, like I, I, I wish that that was like 20 years ago. Like, I don't know, like your thoughts on like toxic masculinity and stuff like that, but it's like it's a big it's a big factor that shaped we were in a weird we grew up in a weird part of that all coming to light i think because like mm -hmm. we like still grew up with it right 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 and we and we grew up like like how many times did you hear like somebody being like that's gay or something like that in high school you know what i mean like everybody would say that shit like it was normal but like when you have somebody put that into perspective for you like oh this is why i don't like when people say that like oh yeah i totally fucking get that mm -hmm. i can see why but it's then when the people who get upset and they're like oh it's just a joke blah 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 it's like yeah kind of but you know you're kind of insulting a person's life <laughs> by no saying exactly <laughs> and it's like also the one thing yeah like toxic masculinity sometimes that like that phrase annoys me too when i see people like label it on something that they just don't like when it's right. like, ah, oh, no, there's parts of masculinity that we need to really address. But like, like you were saying, we grew up in the parts where those toxic stuff were still there. Like we grew yeah, up with that that's... whole idea of being like, you're a pussy, finish that job and like, don't complain and just like put your head down and don't be a weakling kind of thing. And it's just like, yeah, that kind of shit was toxic. And I, I remember for myself, like, I stayed in jobs longer than I should have because of just being like, oh, you can't quit. You you got to just bear down and take the pain and all of that shit. Right. Like right. I made bad decisions because of those stupid ideas put in my head and they're just exactly. stupidity, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm more of, like what I meant about the toxic masculinity. No, and I, I agree with you completely, man. Yeah, it's it's... It is a weird term though for sure that everything is nowadays though like ha, 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 yeah
it's uh yeah <laughs> it is true <laughs> all right buddy uh i i think we're gonna have a little bit to talk about on the question of the podcast so let's go into that buddy but uh sure. craig carswell god yay or nay uh i don't like i believe in the universe okay uh, i believe in what you put out you get back okay I believe God is a label that humans have put on the universe over the years. Um, so my answer to that would definitely be God, nay, but the universe or a higher power, yay, for sure. <laughs> All right. I like that. And you were saying, so when you were doing your uh, music back in the day, you were saying it was like a lot of like, anti-religious stuff kind of thing right yeah i uh we even call it anti it was just like it's just like typical metal shit it's just like you know they're kind of like with the stuff we were writing it was like black metal style stuff so like it's kind of all anti it, i'm anti-established religion like i'm anti mm -hmm. going to a place on a sunday to worship somebody that's supposed to be all around you all mm -hmm. the time within you and stuff like that I've also seen like my friends turn to religion and it's changed their life for the better. I've seen it change people for the worse. Like it, it's got to be like organized religion bothers me. I, I have no problem with people having faith in anything if it helps them get through their day and it makes their life better at the end of the day. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, is that what uh, like you were saying metal has that kind of uh... I guess metal's always been anti-establishment, right? I'm not like, I don't know much about metal at all, but I guess that's kind of part of its genre, right? Yeah, yeah, it's anti-establishment. It's like, there's a lot of bands that are like, like they'll be like, go out there and burn a church. <laughs> 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 I wasn't writing stuff like that. Like I just write my observations because like, I just, I notice a lot of like, a lot of religious people that I know that are like avid Christians or whatever, because that's basically what's around here they're not great people a lot of the time it's like if this isn't making your life better then what's it doing for you like why are you hating other people because of it because that doesn't seem like that's the fundamentals of what it's all about you know what I mean like every religion is fundamentally the same at the end of the day if you look at them like they it's all it, it's all about just you know it just seems to be all it should be all about being good to other people being good to yourself and being good to earth basically Mm -hmm. and i think that they some people back in the day twisted it and made it into what they wanted it to be and that was a bad thing heck yeah hey. it's, it's led to a lot of oppression not only for like people who they just think differently other religions like yeah i just i'm against i'm against organized religion but i definitely think that i think that there's some things too complex to explain strictly with science like being a sentient being for example like mm -hmm. why why has this happened to us like because my theory is that it's just on it's unfortunate that we've become sentient because we're literally on some spinning rock <laughs> in the universe <laughs> flying at a billion miles an hour and you know it's all going to come to an end so it's ha, hard to ha, 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 ha. this sounds like a new song of yours man <laughs> yeah no, that would be a bit too deep for me. <laughs> You'll be working your way into that, man. <laughs> I've, never, I've never really, like, my parents never forced me to go to church or to believe in anything that I didn't want to believe, which I kind of respect because I've come to this, like, yeah, I just agree with, I just think, you know, be a good person, what you put out into the universe and what you ask the universe for, as long as you're willing to work for it, you'll, you'll get it at the end of the day. And I, I believe in the universe, not God. Awesome. So that's my answer. <laughs> awesome. Hey, man, I fucking love that answer. Uh, yeah, hey, I am pretty much on the same page, too. So I, I get what you're saying. Uh, yeah. Greg, man, this was uh, this was a ton of fun, buddy. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. I really do appreciate it. Um, let my audience know where they can find you, your music, uh, anything you want to promote uh, you said you had a show coming up uh yeah go nuts uh let me let my audience know man okay uh you can find me on all major streaming services as a solo artist uh just under craig carswell if you look it up i have three albums available on 
all major streaming services, December songs, Dark and Dreary and Burning Bridges, as well as I've just started getting permission from a bunch of like bigger artists to release their covers for money. So I've got a couple of Matchbox 20 covers out now. And then I just started a, a band called Dorian's Mirror over the pandemic. Uh, in the last six months, me and my friend Joel wrote, recorded, mixed, mastered, edited, and released a 10 song album. Nice. Um, so it's available everywhere now uh, through Dorian's Mirror. And then I have a metal band called We Burned Eden, which is a super <laughs> metal name, but um, that band, uh, we have one song out called Ashes and uh, we're working on more stuff, but that one's kind of just like a passion project for me. Cause I do love heavy metal, but I just don't want to wreck my voice anymore. So that's uh, yeah, where people can find me. I don't really have a website or anything, but you can find me on social media. I'm a friendly guy. I'll add you up and uh, we can chat on there. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I have a couple shows coming up. I'm playing September 11th with my band at uh, High River Brewing Company, where you're playing actually pretty soon here too. I, that was last week and uh, it was so much last fun, weekend. man. Yeah, yeah, so much fun. Great show. So uh, yeah, I'm playing there in September for a, a mini festival. And then I'm playing with Stonegate from Okotoks at the back alley on October 22nd. So that's pretty much all I've got going on. All right, sick. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you're around uh, Calgary or High River, go check those shows out. Yeah, man, fucking so uh, glad to have you on the podcast, dude. And this was uh, amazing. So uh, yeah, check out uh, Craig Carswell, everybody. Uh, and thanks for doing this, Craig. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it.